poppin', Kaiju? It's me, MT, and welcome back to the Heavy Spoiler Show, y'all. And I hope y'all like humans dealing with dinosaur trauma, because this is gonna be a breakdown of the Godzilla movie from 2014, a whole decade ago. Can y'all believe that? Like, that was the year that I graduated college and began my life of crippling debt. Good times. But anyways, let's make like Godzilla and take a big old bite into this monster of a breakdown, shall we? But yo, listen, real quick, Godzilla's like super powerful powerful with his atomic breath, right? But did you know that you, yes you, have a special power all of your own as well? Right at your fingertips too! And that power is the power to make me and Paul's day by using your finger to tap that like and subscribe button. Every like goes a long way to letting YouTube know that you love what we do here, and we always appreciate it. But anyways, the Godzilla movie opens up with what appears to be an early cave wall drawing depicting Godzilla himself, as the creature in this image was drawn with Godzilla's very scaly back. Then immediately following this is ancient imagery of what appears to be a group of Christian men doing some sort of ceremony on the back of a giant fish. This is actually art depicting the story journey of the Irish saint Brendan the Navigator and how during his seven year journey across the ocean, a giant whale would show up every year at Easter to allow Brendan and his Christian homies to perform a whole mass on its back. So needless to say, Whoever wrote that story is a uh, very likely no stranger to magic mushrooms. After this, we can see a drawing of the Ichthyosaurus fossil, the reptilian species of lizard that this intro implies that Godzilla possibly evolved from, with the name Ichthyosaurus quite literally meaning fish lizard. Then flashes of Charles Darwin's On the Origins of Species appear, which is of course the famous book published by Darwin that included his revolutionary research on the concept of species evolution. This is then followed by an ancient artwork of Heracles fighting the mythical Kido sea serpent, heavily implying here that past sightings of Godzilla's evolving fish lizard species could have inspired some truth behind those legends. And this opening also seemingly implies that Godzilla or one of his species were responsible for the 1898 sinking of the USS Maine warship, an event that would inevitably lead to the 10 week Spanish American war. Then we see reports of a separate American military submarine carrying 25 people sinking on the western coast only for that submarine to be rediscovered later with the government denying that they had other submarines unaccounted for, which definitely feels like Monarch trying to cover up Kaiju's continued feeding on the nuclear arsenals of navies across the world. In this Godzilla 2014 movie, we can see just how far a Kaiju can toss a warship when the US military catches a Muto eating all of that spicy radiation inside of nuclear missiles from a missing Russian warship. Then after this, we get a quote about Godzilla from paleontologist Harry S. Lad that calls his species a species of reptile that we thought was extinct. This animal did not die from any event, it is alive in the Pacific, with the words destroy the creature at the bottom, accompanied by a picture of this Harry Ladd fellow looking downwards. Harry S. Ladd was a real life scientist who was famous for studying fossils in the Pacific, but in the MonsterVerse, he did a little bit more than dig for bones. He apparently was one of Monarch's most crucial leaders and assets alongside a Dr. Leonard Schultz and Commander Roger Revel shortly after the organization started to really take off. Harry S. Ladd was exceptionally familiar with the geology of the Bikini Atlas Islands, which also get referenced a number of times during this opening, as the real-life nuclear tests conducted on those islands gave the creators of the MonsterVerse much creative inspiration, as we learn in this movie that the nuclear explosions at Bikini Atoll weren't actual nuclear tests at all, but a secret attempt by multinational entities to destroy Godzilla completely. And while this intro does give us a few flashes of imagery from this event, Apple TV's recent Monarch Legacy of Monsters series gives us a front row seat to this very attempt to murder Godzilla and the messed up military politics that led to that decision. But anyways, right after we get this quote from Ladd, we see what appears to be a military communication that references the deputy director of Monarch at the time and how that deputy director strongly suggests that the eradication of Godzilla is not only a matter of national security, but that of the entire planet, with the deputy director of Monarch possibly referring to Lee Shaw of Monarch Legacy of Monsters, specifically when he informs General Puckett that the atomic explosion at Bikini Atoll did not kill Godzilla at all. Then after this, we get this frame of a map of Japan next to this piece of quickly redacted text meant to highlight Brian Cranston's name. 
But before it's redacted, the text says, Walter Malcolm has claimed that government men dressed in white lab coats routinely appear at the site, and shortly after the event, all residents are sworn to silence. The name Walter Malcolm appears to have been made as a reference to Brian Cranston's iconic roles as Breaking Bad's Walter White and Hal from Malcolm in the Middle. Then later we get a paragraph of text that references the biblical passages of Job 41, Psalm 74, 14, and Isaiah 27 as each of these passages reference the mythical Leviathan sea serpent, connecting Godzilla to yet another culture's folklore. This is next to an image of the Argonne National Laboratory at Palos Park, a laboratory built as a result of the Manhattan Project that was eventually tasked with producing peaceful nuclear energy solutions for the world. The Palos Park unit, also known as Site A, was the site in the Argonne Forest where the world's first nuclear reactor, Chicago Pile 1, was reconstructed to make a new nuclear reactor called Chicago Pile 2. Then after we get old film imagery with the text Project Monarch on it, we get a plaque commemorating the world's first nuclear bomb explosion at the White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico the precursor to the eventual bombing of Hiroshima, Japan by the United States, an event that we learn later has deeply scarred Dr. Serizawa. Then, after we get footage of soldiers and scientists gearing up to explode their secret Godzilla nuke as the soon-to-be irradiated people of Bikini Atoll watch, the opening credits end with that same anti-Godzilla nuke exploding, leaving a rain of nuclear ash as the Godzilla title appears. Having been released on May 16th, 2014, this movie's release coincides with the Godzilla franchise's 60th birth year, as the original Godzilla film was released on October 27th, 1954. With the film only needing $380 million to break even, Godzilla 2014 would end up raking in around 529 million bucks, making it a surefire box office success and a strong start to Legendary's Baby Monsterverse. The positive response to this movie would, of course, help Gareth Edwards score his chance at directing his own Star Wars film two years later with 2016's Rogue One. Inspired very much by the slow, suspenseful buildup that made the 1975 thriller Jaws such a beloved and terrifying classic, Gareth Edwards emulated a lot of that tone with how he introduces the kaiju of this film, with Godzilla not really making an appearance until around the 59 minute mark of the movie. And Jaws' influence is also where the Brody family gets their name from, as the main character of Jaws is police chief Martin Brody. Speaking of Godzilla, at one point, the movie was going to show Godzilla emerge out of some ice in a Siberian glacier at one point. However, because the 2013 Superman movie Man of Steel recently came out with a glacier scene that was very close to their own idea, that imagery was ultimately scrapped. But anyways, moving on, the film then brings us to the year 1999 as we watch Ishiro Serizawa and his partner Vivian Graham arrive at a universal western mining site. Ishiro Serizawa is of course played by iconic actor Ken Watanabe, with the character's name being a mashup of two different names. 1954 Godzilla director Ishiro Honda, as well as Godzilla 54 character Dr. Daisuke Serizawa. But anyways, at this mining site, miners who thought they struck at a uranium deposit accidentally find the underground tomb of a dead member of Godzilla's species, along with the eggs of the bad kaiju of this movie, with the male muto of this species having hatched first and creating a trail of dirt leading to the ocean, where that kaiju would swim or otherwise use some hollow earth portals to make their way on over to the fictional city of Janjira, Japan, in order to feed off of the radiation from their nuclear reactors as they continued their metamorphosis into the winged muto that would hatch in front of both Brody men 15 years later. Not only did that cocoon cause the meltdown at the Genjiro power plant that would eventually claim the life of Sandra Brody in 1999, but that very same cocoon hatching would of course lead to the eventual demise of Ford's father Joseph as well. So it's kind of crazy how just one mining expedition could domino in such a crazy way. But Ford would of course get his revenge on these Mutos by murdering a bunch of Muto babies by the end of the film. You kill my parents, I kill your kids. It's the circle of life or something like that. It's been a while since I've watched Lion King. Throughout the movie, these winged kaiju species that Godzilla would face were never actually given a proper name. They're only referred to as Muto, with Muto, of course, meaning massive unidentified terrestrial organism, and not actually the name of a particular species of kaiju. Like, it literally would not be until 2019's Godzilla Aftershock comic that this species of kaiju were given the proper name Titanus Jinshin Mushi, with Jinshin Mushi meaning earthquake beetle 
This insectoid species of kaiju were directly responsible for the near extinction of Godzilla's kind, with Godzilla being heavily implied to be the very last of his species. This is because these Jinshin Mushi bugs made a habit of reproducing by hunting down Godzilla's species and laying eggs inside of their dead bodies, which is pretty hardcore. They do this in order for their babies to have a plethora of radioactive meat to feed on right after they hatch, the aftermath of which Dr. Sarazawa and Graham witnessed in the Philippines as they stood amongst the fossilized remains of one of Godzilla's species. But anyways, when we first meet the Brody family in 1999 Jinjira, Japan, we see a young Ford excitedly hop out of his bed to celebrate his father's birthday. However, when he does, we very much see an interesting set of plastic foreshadowing on the ground. Ford's toys appear to not only tease Ford's future as a soldier in the US Armed Forces, but it also foreshadows the night of his father's death, as a toy dinosaur can be seen amongst army jeeps and a helicopter all of which were present when the United States Army tried to save Joseph Broly's life during their military helicopter ride to the USS Saratoga. As a young Ford drags his father's happy birthday banner on the ground past his army and dinosaur toys, we can see that Ford also has a bit of an interest in outer space, as a toy Saturn V rocket can be seen on the ground as well. This rocket could also be seen as a piece of Ford foreshadowing, as it very much resembles the missile that Ford escorts with the military on the West Coast later on in the film. Behind this rocket, a Japanese monster film poster can be seen featuring a kaiju that looks very similar to the main big butterfly bug baddies that Godzilla has to exterminate later on in this movie. As young Ford sneaks a peek at his distressed father on the phone, you can see a family photo of them all on his computer desk, that very same photo that Joseph would later find 15 years later in the wreckage of the quarantine Genjira. And speaking of Genjira, fun fact, the power plant that the Brodies work at in the following scene was originally going to be set in the real world island of Hokkaido, Japan in an earlier version of the script, but the team opted to have this catastrophe occur in a fictional city instead. When that catastrophe happens, a young Ford Brody witnesses the destruction of the Janjira power plant from his classroom, rudely interrupting his teacher's lesson on moth metamorphosis, a clear reference to Mothra from the original Godzilla films. As Ford looks through his classroom window, a dinosaur skeleton can be seen below a red paper bird hanging from the ceiling. A possible reference to both Godzilla and Rodan, respectively. Then we quickly transition to the year 2014, where we meet a Ford aged up 15 years to be played by actor Aaron Taylor Johnson. And while Aaron Taylor Johnson was indeed director Gareth Edwards' first choice, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Scoot McNary, Caleb Landry-Jones, and Henry Cavill were all considered at one point for the role of adult Ford Brody. But anyways, after Ford gets home after being deployed as an explosive ordnance disposal specialist, we see him reunite with his son, who has made him a special banner, much like Ford did for his own dad. And while Ford tucks his son to sleep, we can see in the background that his son has drawn him a picture of Ford on a boat, because Ford Brody himself was of course part of the United States Navy. And then after this, we all have the displeasure of having to watch Pietro make out with his sister Wanda Maximoff in a Stafford University shirt. Which is so weird in a post-Age of Ultron world. But hey, this was pre-Age of Ultron, so I guess... I guess it's fine, I don't know, it's some Game of Thrones shit, man. Then the scene quickly shifts to Tokyo, Japan, when Ford has to pick his father up from jail. And when they get back to Joe's messy-ass apartment, Ford cannot help but notice all the newspaper articles and conspiracies that cover his father's walls with one of those articles even correctly guessing that the Bikini Atoll nuclear explosions weren't your average nuclear tests and were actually cover-ups for something much bigger. And seeing all of this craziness, Ford makes a desperate plea for his father to stop, but Joe refuses because he feels immense guilt for being the one who sent his wife Sandra to die and wants to prove that the Janjira meltdown was more than just some freak accident. But when he talks about his wife, notice how we see Joe's reflection of his own face in the window, very much harkening back to when Joe had to look through that sealed door window to watch his wife take her last breaths. This of course convinces Ford to join his father in entering the bogus Janjira quarantine zone to get back to their old house. As Ford makes his way through his old messed up room, the word Mothra can be seen written on one of his old moth tanks. Ford didn't actually write the word Mothra on the tank, but instead wrote the words Dad's Moth on a piece of tape. 
and that tape covered over another word that ended in RA. So the dirtiness of the room made that labeling look like Mothra. Another fun Mothra nod by the set design team. Then after this, Ford and his father are arrested in the quarantine zone and brought to the wreckage of the Genjira power plant just in time for the butterfly inspired male Mudo to pop out of his cocoon and murder a bunch of people, including Ford's dad, Mr. Brian Cranston himself. And also random fun fact about Brian Cranston, dude has loved monsters seemingly his entire life. So much so that Brian Cranston was actually the voice of Snizzard and the twin man, two of Rita's monsters in the original Mighty Morphin Power Rangers show. Billy Cranston, the blue Mighty Morphin Power Ranger, takes his last name from Mr. Brian Cranston himself. And his involvement in the show is primarily why he was chosen to play Zordon in the 2017 Power Rangers movie. So needless to say, I'm sure Brian Cranston was amped to be involved in this Godzilla production despite his character suffering a pretty early death. And yo, speaking of giant robots fighting monsters, if he didn't already have his hands full with directing Pacific Rim at the time, Guillermo del Toro was actually heavily considered to direct this film before Gareth Edwards was brought on board, which is kind of crazy, but I'm glad things happened the way they did because we got two dope monster movies from Legendary instead of just one. And God do I hope that these two franchises cross over one day because we need to see it. I want to see Godzilla team up with a team of Jaegers, man. Let's make it happen. And call Guillermo del Toro to come back and make another good Pacific Rim film because that last one, uh, not for me. But do you know what else was considered? A cameo from Mr. Akira Takarada, one of the original actors from the classic Godzilla films who has made a number of cameos in past Godzilla movies. A scene with Takarada was filmed where he would play an immigration officer at an airport that interacts with Ford, but unfortunately that scene would be deleted. Takarada's death in 2022 made this deleted scene Takarada's last ever appearance in a Godzilla film. Rest in peace, King. But anyways, Ford is of course brought to the USS Saratoga where he is briefed by Monarch and the US military about the origins of Monarch and humanity's history with Kaiju. With Doctors Sarazawa and Graham revealing that the event that specifically first woke Godzilla up in the MonsterVerse was the submerging of the USS Nautilus submarine, which was actually the world's first ever nuclear powered submarine. As soon as that radioactive ship went deep underwater in 1945, Godzilla's nostrils got a tingling and that big ass amphibious reptile woke the hell up. Then after Ford tells Monarch and the military that his father was tracking echolocation patterns, Ford is then sent to Honolulu, Hawaii in order to catch a flight back to San Francisco, only for Godzilla himself to make his first ever appearance on the world stage when he detects the presence of the male Mido munching on some Russian nukes like there were some Taki chips. Weighing a whopping 90,000 tons and standing at 355 feet, there is a reason why this Godzilla is the king of monsters in Legendary's MonsterVerse. He was literally the biggest Godzilla ever made, with the original Godzilla and the new Godzilla from Godzilla Minus One both standing at 164 feet. And to design Godzilla's face to be as commanding as possible, the visual effects department apparently used the faces of Komodo dragons, bears, dogs, and eagles in order to get it all just right. But anyways, right after Godzilla makes a big scream on TV, Ford's son Sam wakes up from a long night of playing with his own toy dinosaurs in his living room, much like his dad did when he was young. He then tells his mom to check out the real dinosaur on TV because frankly, that dinosaur was doing some pretty rad shit at an airport, and he didn't want Wanda to miss it. But anyways, after Reptar and the big butterfly yell at each other for a bit, the male Mudo bugs off to go find his girlfriend slash sister, a very pregnant sister girlfriend who just hatched in Nevada. Serizawa and Graham correctly predict that these Mudos would hit America's stash of nuclear materials in the Yucca Mountains, right on the border of California, with the pregnant Mido that hit that stash being seen fleeing the scene as she walks over a number of Las Vegas landmarks like Caesar's Palace and Hara's Casino. And right after this, images of that same kaiju destroying the half-scale replica of the Eiffel Tower at the Paris Las Vegas Casino can be seen on one of Monarch's TVs. Then after this, Godzilla makes his big appearance on mainland America as he ascends onto the panicked drivers of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, California. And fun fact, Gareth Edwards actually had a full 400 foot replica of the Golden Gate Bridge built for this sequence, which is crazy dope. This destruction of the Golden Gate Bridge by Godzilla was a significant moment in Legendary's MonsterVerse, especially in Monarch Legacy of Monsters. In that show, we learned that Kate Randa, the granddaughter of Monarch founder William Randa, was traumatized 
surprised after a school bus full of her students plunged into the ocean as a result of Reptar's rampage. But anyways, in order to retrieve a nuclear warhead stolen by the male Muto, Brody and a team of army personnel perform a halo jump to descend onto San Francisco, with halo of course standing for high altitude, low opening. But what's super dope about this moment is that while a good amount of the scene does have CG elements, they actually did film real skydivers diving from a plane intercut with studio captured imagery. Gareth Edwards purposely made this moment ultra eerie, suspenseful, and foreboding because he wanted it to feel like angels descending into hell, while citing Dante's Inferno as a bit of inspiration for him. And after they land, the military is able to retrieve the warhead while Ford stays behind to blow up the Muto eggs. I really loved how Gareth Edwards included the female Muto crying out in pain at the sight of her charred, destroyed eggs, as it really made these monsters truly feel like animals just trying to survive, as opposed to, you know, malicious titans purposely trying to ruin humanity. As Ford flees from the wrath of a pissed off Muto, he hops into a boat called Go Whale Tours, with the name Go Whale being a nod to Godzilla, as Godzilla's Japanese name Gojira literally means Gorilla Whale, so Go Whale is definitely a nod to that. But anyways, that is it for this breakdown of 2014's Godzilla film. What an amazing way to kick off such a great monster verse, man. Like, I freaking love this movie, man. Like, Gareth Edwards should definitely come back to direct another one of these things. But anyways, you can follow me at Mastertainment on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or wherever I am on the internet, including the Guardians of the Galaxy podcast, where me and my friends Whitney Van Lanningham and Tommy Bechtold just talk about some really fun nerd shit while being absolute goofballs doing it. But most importantly, you can follow Heavy Spoilers here on YouTube, and when you do, please hit that notification bell so that you can get notifications every time we upload a video. And yo, please consider becoming a member of the Heavy Spoilers team. It's literally only 99 cents a month, and that small amount would go a long way to supporting the channel. Members get early access to videos before anybody else. So if you like what we do and want to get content sooner than everybody else, become a member today. It's only a dollar a month. But regardless, thanks again for watching this video. You guys are amazing. I love you guys so much. And I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.